you know, we get up in the day in the morning and we plan our outfits. <laughs> Some of us plan our outfits according to our horses as well. And you put into your mind's eye of like what that perfect ride's going to be. And when it's not perfect, we all know we obsess about it all day long. We're like, oh my gosh, we had a bad ride. It's the end of the day, right? It's, it's, it's the end of the world. So thinking about like how to keep it simple, to speak your horse's language. Every, every horse has a different personality, right? And they all have a different shape and they all have a different mind. And so what I'm trying to say is learn to speak your horse's language because their language is very simple. And if you get on and you say, you know, you ask questions, you don't dictate, you don't force, but you ask questions and you ask the horse, okay, do you feel sluggish today? Do you feel in front of my leg? Do you feel like you want to work? And then if they do, then you say, do you feel like you can do collection? Do you feel like you can do sideways? And I always see what people do, even when I am in a clinics, they'll say, well, but I have to walk trot and canter. And I'm like, no, you don't. If you haven't mastered first gear, why go into second mm-hmm. gear? Why go into third gear? So as hard mm-hmm. as this sport is, that's what I mean by keeping it simple. Um, go back to the basics. So you don't obsess about having that bad ride at the end of the day. Welcome to the Practical Horseman podcast, featuring conversations with respected riders, industry leaders, and horse care experts. The show is co-hosted by Practical Horseman editors, and our goal is to inform, educate, and inspire. I'm Julia Murphy, and this week's episode is with International Grand Prix dressage rider and trainer, Krissa Hoffman. Krissa is a USDF bronze, silver, and gold medalist who owns and operates CFH Dressage in Vero Beach, Florida. She first found herself in the spotlight aboard Harry Callahan, an American saddlebred who she trained from three years old to Grand Prix. The duo earned top placings in Florida against high-ranking riders aboard their warm bloods, a feat that not many thought was possible. In 2009, Krista and her horse Ferrelli topped the Gold Coast opener in Wellington in a class of 25 top horses and riders. That season, they went on to finish in the top six in the World Cup qualifier in Wellington, which earned her a ranking on the USET shortlist of riders. Krista has worked with some of the best trainers in America and abroad, including Stefan Peters, Michelle Gibbon, Barbara Silverman, Robert Dover, and Christoph Hess. She applies her classical dressage background to the modern day show ring and in her training program with students. Over the years, she has trained multiple horses to the Grand Prix and FEI levels. She prides herself on developing each horse with simple, quiet riding that focuses on proper equitation and correct communication between horse and rider. In this episode, Krista will speak about her training philosophy for both herself and her students and will share more about her two mounts that you heard about before Callahan and Ferrelli. During our conversation, I also asked Krissa for some training tips for my young horse, Mo, and she gave great advice that can be applied to everyone's training. Before we dive into the podcast with Krissa, I'd like to thank the sponsor of this week's episode, Troxel, and share their message. Your safety is in good hands with the Troxel Liberty Helmet. Over 4 million riders have chosen a Troxel helmet to protect themselves. With a safety record second to none, Troxel is the most trusted brand of ASTM slash SEI certified equestrian helmets. As pioneers in equestrian helmet safety, over 30 years of research and development go into every Troxel helmet available today. Your safety matters to us. Now enjoy the episode with Krissa. So just to get started with some basic questions so that I can get to know you and our audience can get to know you, um, I was wondering how you got interested in horses and riding to begin with. Um, I started riding at uh, an event farm in Louisville, Kentucky, around the time I was nine. Um, I had gone to a summer camp that introduced me to horses, and it was kind of game over (laughs) after I got on the horse the first time. So, Mm -hmm, As it is for so many of us. (laughs) Yes. I begged my parents to find a local farm, um, and luckily they found a wonderful place that I ended up staying all through high school. Um, her name's Susan Harris. She runs Spring Run Farm. Uh, it was an eventing barn primarily. So I grew up in that field. Um, and I had my first horse at 12. He was an Appaloosa. He was 12 years old. He was sometimes a bit of a pistol to ride, but he taught me how to ride, that's for sure. And mm-hmm. um, through the years, competed all the way up to um, prelim three-day eventing. And 
just loved it. And just, that was just my passion. And I think that I was interestingly enough, a very shy child. And so I think the horses helped me find confidence and almost to me like an art form and allowed me to express myself. So I always, people ask me that all the time. And I say the most grateful thing I am for in my life is horses. Um, They just shape you into the person you are. And I think that I'm so fortunate that I was able to, to take that path. And what part of your, at what point in your career did you decide to make the switch from eventing to focusing on dressage? So it was my high school year of um, senior year, and I had a really, really nice Argentinian thoroughbred. We were going up to train with Denny Emerson for the entire summer, and I went with a bunch of my friends. We would go every summer. And about halfway, I don't know, an hour and a half from Louisville, we don't know what happened, but he was in the very back of the trailer. We don't know if it was a bee sting or somebody threatened him, you know, like he was going to be kicked or something, but he somehow bucked and his hind leg got over the petition. Well, the little pin mm-hmm. that you put in the back of the trailer went, severed his entire extensor tendon. Oh my so gosh. we pulled over on the side of the highway. He obviously was three-legged. It was horrific. Um, we had truckers stopping by. It was the most godly thing you've ever seen. And it was just so painful to watch. Luckily, there was a veterinarian literally 20 minutes down the road named Barbara Schmidt. And I'd never heard of her. She, we called her and she said, I'll get my trailer over there. We took all the horses out of the trailer and um, just started unloading them on the highway, which is very scary, as you can imagine. Mm -hmm. And she came to pick him up and she said, you know, he's got 25% chance of living. He might not make it. Um, we'll cast him from his stifle to his hoof. And he was kind of the, the, the hero horse. I mean, he was ended up in some of her articles. Long story short, she said he'll never jump again, but he could be a dressage horse. And I thought, mm. what am I going to do with a dress, an Argentinian thoroughbred with dressage? <laughs> so <laughs> at that time, I mean, it was like I had to wave all my friends goodbye. And they all ended up going to Vermont. And I went up there, I don't know, almost every day for the next six months. And just, we nursed him back to health and he made a full recovery. And I ended up finding a local trainer who had just moved to Kentucky named Barbara Silverman, who was my first protege. And she said, I'll take you on. And this is kind of a neat kind of looking horse. And I don't know how far we'll get with him because he's not really built for it, but let's give it a try. So lo and behold, we got him to fourth level and I was hooked. And and honestly, like I had no other option. This was the horse I had. And I was honestly the lazy (laughs) event rider. I loved cross country. I loved jumping. And I thought dressage is so boring. I just wanted to get through (laughs) it. And so I was like, here I am. Oh my gosh, I'm going to go do the, like the worst phase. But she let me sit on her Grand Prix horse. And I thought, I don't care if I ever jump a jump again. It was the most exhilarating feeling to feel that level of power, but control and the Piaf and Passage and just, just the execution of all of it. And I thought, this is it. I'm done. I'm hooked. So I ended up staying with her, um, gosh, eight years and um, ended up working for her and never went back. And people wow. always said, don't you miss the jumping? Don't you miss the cross country? And I thought, you know, it's like I had, I'd already done it. And I was competing at top level at 17, 18. And I was like, this is a new path. Like I, this was so difficult that it made me want to kind of try to master it. Because wow, I what a story. <laughs> I what a I story. It, so I thought, well, let's just give it a try. So yeah, she was the reason I converted to the dark side, as they say. <laughs> and you've been doing dressage for so long now. So what do you think kept you doing dressage? Was it, you know, like you said, you had that moment where you thought, I don't need to ever jump again. And how, how has it progressed that it's kept it's, you? I think it's just the, um, the perfectionism of it, the art artistry of it. I was an art major in college. I feel like dressage horses are so much of an art form, um, how you can transform them and their, 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 their minds and their way of going that I, I found it very artistic. And I mean, we all admit that once you get into it, it's very addictive. <laughs> um <laughs> And just the harmony, the harmony between horse and rider. I mean, I think event riders are so talented. I'm not taking that away from them. It's also a lot of guts and glory. I mean, it's you've got to have a lot of 
no fear, to put it that way. And dressage, I feel like it's a better communication with horse and rider a little bit um, because it's so precise. So I think right. the precision, the artistry, just just the beautiful art form in the end. I just love mm -hmm. that training process. Yeah. And it's a difficult one. <laughs> it is a very difficult. It takes very, very, very patient rider. Yes, for sure. And each horse is different. Some progress faster than the others, but you just have to stay the course and learn that individual. Because if you don't, it's, it's just not going to work. And so c throughout the years, could you name some people who have influenced your riding? Sure. Um, I've been fortunate enough to, to ride with some of the very best in, in the country. Um, like I said, Barbara Silverman, and she passed away when she was 42. At that time, I was 22 or 23, and it was devastating because I thought, you know, here I am in Kentucky, we've got this full barn, and everybody's looking at me like you're going to have to take over the reins, and I'm like, I'm just a kid. Like, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> um, but she, she taught me, we went to Europe together. She taught me not only the riding skill part, but she also taught me a business part about buying horses and selling them as another source of income within the sport. So at that point, that's what happened. I mean, I was given all these clients and one of which was my future mother-in-law <laughs> and I, and I ran the barn and a couple years after that, the, the owners decided to close and I went to a farm that specialized in saddlebreds and Morgans and they had a beautiful facility and they asked me if I would come. So I was head trainer there for eight years. Um, and at that point she had a really fancy Morgan. And I was riding, I was going down in the winter to take my warm blood to Robert Dover. Um, Barbara said, when I die, I want you to ride with Robert because that was her coach. So I was oh. fortunate to take him. And that was his first Morgan um, that he had seen that had gotten to that level. We got him to pre-St. George. Um, I've ridden with Stefan Peters, Robert Dover, Tina Kanyat, um, a very, very good German trainer named Alex Gerding. I rode with him for probably the most of my life other than Barbara. Um, he's now quit riding, but he was a great influence in my life and my riding. And um, recently been working with Catherine Haddad. And so mm -hmm. I've been I've been very blessed. And what about some of the most influential horses in your life and your career? Well I think if anyone Googles me, you're gonna <laughs> you're gonna find out that I took a saddle bread to Grand Prix. Um, and it's funny because people are like, oh, you're the person that rode Harry Callahan. And, and and that honestly was the horse that stamped me, not only to put me on the map because it was so obscure what I was doing, taking in saddlebred and competing against horses in Wellington. Um, right. But it also taught me, he taught me more than any horse I've ever had because he wasn't built for the job. He was, I mean, he was five gated blood. He had no, no chance to be a dressage horse. Um, but he was brought out of a field and he was started by a local woman and I got him when he was five and we competed third level at six. He landed on the USDF cover um, and he was doing Grand Prix at 10. The fastest horse I've ever trained at Grand Prix. He could do everything wow. in a Snapple. And so he be, kind of became famous. I mean, we were in nine publications, three of which were in Germany. I was the first rider to ever be asked to do um, what is now dressage today on demand used to be dressage training online. And I was the first one and yep. I was so excited that I was like, wow, I'm so honored to be um, asked to do this. And the former owner, Risa Bonetti, she said, the reason I want you, she's like, don't, don't think that I don't think you're good or anything, but she's like, you're riding the average horse in somebody's backyard. This is not where yeah. we're watching Edward Gall ride Totalis, right? Like it's just, mm -hmm. it's different. So yeah. she said, there's so much, um, demand for this because you know he's a two thousand dollar saddle brought out of a field and mm -hmm. so and people can relate like, to that absolutely and again people are like well how did you do it i've had people ask me would you write a book about it i'm like it's really no different than basics are basics but because of his shape i had to do things i had to think outside of the box sometimes um and they're a little bit hotter than warm bloods um so their minds are a little bit more fragile but they're very kind animals and I've been asked by so many breeders, would you do another one? I'm like, I might, I might do one, another one one day. So 
he's by far um, my favorite horse of all time. Then I would say, secondly, the first horse that put me on the map internationally was a horse named Ferelli that my, at that time, German trainer found for me in Germany. Um, he, our biggest accomplishment, we were six in the World Cup qualifier. He was a big, coming from Harry, who was 15, three on a good day and very light and could do everything in a snaffle. I went to Ferelli, who was 17 hands, <laughs> big bodied, kind of heavy, a little bit lazy type. Um, but I think those two have been my most influential horses. And you kind of touched on it a moment ago with uh, the World Cup. Can you tell us about some of your most meaningful accomplishments in your career? Yeah, I will go back to the Saddlebred. Um, it was, you know, it's great to go to a CDI and finish in the top six in a World Cup qualifier. That was wonderful. That was a great experience. That was at the old um, showgrounds um, in Wellington. But I think the most memorable was when I showed Harry in Wellington and there were 30 people in my class and top, top. I mean, I'm naming, naming some of the top riders in the world. And people looked at me and they're like, what is she doing? Why is she putting that saddle bread in the Grand Prix, especially <laughs> in Wellington? <laughs> and I was like, you know what? Because at the end of the day, he's easier than my warm blood who might score better, but I have more fun on the little saddle bread because I know he mm -hmm. won't make a mistake. I know he's going to give me his heart. And we went in there, <clears throat> excuse me, and out of 30 horses, he was, he was in sixth place. And I thought, okay, I've won the Olympics. Like, <laughs> like this is yeah. the most exciting day of my life. And people, literally, some people were like, yeah, I can't believe she did that on that junky saddle bread. And I'll never forget, it was um, Charlotte Berdahl was the judge. And she wrote at the very end of it, and I saved that test. She said, at the end of the day, I know this horse and I know who he is, but you make it look so easy. What harmony. And I thought, that's all I need to hear. Like, I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> what a compliment. Yeah. Time. Right. So um, that was probably my biggest and most memorable because it was such a challenge. It was, I was doing something that nobody else was doing. I mean, and do you there, ever, I'm sure there oh, are other sorry. saddlebreds that have gotten to FEI, but not going down there and competing against some of our top riders. Right. And when you found yourself in that position and now um, when you're competing, do you ever find that you get nerves? Um, I do in the sense that I'm excited to compete. I don't right. get nerves that I think that I'm not going to do well. Mm -hmm. um, I don't go in the arena. I guess I'm, everybody's different, right, with their competition nerves. I go into the arena like I can't wait to be here. I'm excited to be here. And I and I'll never forget Tiger Woods mentioned this a long time ago. He said, if you don't have some level of nerves, there's something wrong with you, right? Like you mm -hmm. all, you have to have some level, but I, it's never of, it doesn't come from a place where I think, I, oh, what are people going to think? Or what if I don't do well? You know, that, I, that doesn't really enter my mind. So I guess right. I'm fortunate that way. And I think massage writers, I mean, we're all perfectionists and mm -hmm. it's, you know, we want it to be perfect, 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 but I like to kind of go out there and say, okay, this is what I've been doing. What do, what do you think of it, Judge? <laughs> kind of thing. Right. And this sport is so unpredictable, you know, dealing with horses. You never know what's going to happen. And sometimes, you know, we have a bad day or our horses have a bad day. So when you find yourself in that position, how do you deal with maybe not winning a class you really wanted to or not doing well in a class or maybe not winning as much as you would like to? How would you deal with that? You know, I don't even think of it as like winning or not doing. I mean, of course, it's always great to to win and have a blue ribbon and, and come away from a competition on that high. But I also think that sometimes I've gone in there, like you just said, and and thought, oh, gosh, I really just like goofed up. Like, what was I? Where was my head? And I think horses can do the same thing. And it's when you have that partnership, you're like, all right, I, you took one for the team. Like, I'll get you next time. <laughs> you know, kind of thing. Like, we'll be together next time because they are living, breathing animals. I mean, they do have opinions. They do have good and bad days. So I don't, I don't know. I guess I just think, sure, when it matters and we're down center line and let's say we're going to the Olympic qualifiers, I'm going to be like, okay, we both have to be together, but it's realistic. I mean, it's just reality. Like you're going to have a good day and they're going to have a good day or they're going to have a bad day yeah. and you're going to have a bad day. And so I think I'm just always trying to be in tune with my horses. And I, there have been times where I've been in the warm up and I thought, He's just not feeling it. Like, and I'm not going to go in there and make it a bad experience and I'll scratch. Right. Mm -hmm. And I don't mm -hmm. do it because I don't want to get a bad score. You know, I really, you know, sure. We don't want that posted, but 
the end of the day, it's their welfare, not my score. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and before you do a big competition, do you have any kind of routine that you like to get yourself ready? It's just funny. So my, one of my pair, my para rider who's been riding with me, she's been riding with many, many other trainers prior to me. And we were competing at WEC and it was on my new Grand Prix horse. And I don't know what I'm going to get. You know, you just kind of go into this, like, I don't know what, what he's going to do in the ring. I've never shown him. Um, and she's like, do you want me to leave you alone? Do you want me to leave you in the tack room? Do you want you like privacy? And I was like, no, <laughs> like, I don't want you to do any of that. Like, I, I don't know. I don't really have a routine. I don't get, I don't need to kind of get in that zone. I just, I just know once I'm in the saddle, I'm ready to go. Right. And um, actually speaking of para riders, I wanted to ask you a little bit about that because you you train so many people, including para riders. So I was curious if you find there's a difference in the training when you're working with a para rider. Um, there is as far as symmetry, um, but nothing else has become an obstacle when I've been helping Katie. Um, Katie actually you can look her up. Katie Jackson, she's a grade five para rider and um, she is has amputee from her right leg down. So she's basically strapped into the saddle. Um, luckily, she came to me and she bought my old Grand Prix horse. So she's been with me now two years. But I think the biggest challenge um, is just symmetry because of weight, right? She's always going to be heavier on the left side because she has a leg. So we have to work very hard on lining her spine up and her hips to where he can feel that symmetry. And occasionally I have to get on and kind of check him and say, okay, maybe he's a little bit hollow to the right, but why wouldn't he be? She doesn't have a right leg. Um, right. But it's incredible what she's done. I mean, she's taken him out for St. George. She took him out last season. She won the I-1 against many good professionals. Um, and it was so great when she came out of the ring, Ashley Holzer said, you know what? And she just started bowing down to her. And she said, you have just proven that we don't need legs. We can do this all from our seat. And she really is proof of that. Yeah, absolutely. But no, yeah, I, I'm I actually any differently. So, and I, the, um, I, I would just say symmetry in, in her mm -hmm. case, right? Right. That's her case. Have you taught any other para riders? I have. Um, I used to teach a woman, I actually sold her two horses named Dale Dedrick. Um, I think she's retired from sport now, but she, what she, always, she was able bodied, um, but very, very weak. Um, had a lot of health issues. I think it was MS that she had. Um, so for her, it was really about finding a perfect temperament of horse, right? Not something too goey, not something too heavy um, that could carry somebody that's that's slighter in frame and build. Um, yeah, so those are the two I've worked with. Going into your training a little bit more, um, do you think you have a training philosophy? And if you do, could you describe it? I think, you know, everybody, ha we all have our way to, to roam, but I think mine is um, every rider that I get, and I feel like even clinics when I teach all over, I feel like the biggest hole in people's riding is one, their position, and two, keeping it simple. That's what I do in my training. I keep it simple, right? Horses yeah. are very simple-minded creatures, and I think the more aids we give and the more confusing it, it gets for them, it becomes not fun and it becomes unclear. And so I always, you know, there's, I'll listen to other trainers and they're saying, da, 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 you know, all these things. And I'm like, the rider can't even process the 10 things you just screamed at them. How can the horse process that? So I'm right. very like, it's very simple. Um, is the horse in rhythm and regularity? Is the horse in balance? Is it between two legs, two reins? Can I supple him? Can I take this sideways? Can I move it around? Can I adjust it? Can I change the length of frame? Can I change the length of stride? But I don't give a lot of aids that are going to muddy the water, if that makes sense. So I would say people mm -hmm. that ride with me, they're like, wow, you made it so simple. And I've heard that. <laughs> I have a dollar for every time I've heard that. <laughs> um, but I would say that's my training philosophy. You know, the horses need to be happy. They need to understand what we're telling them. And I feel like a lot of people get confused or lost in that translation. 
you touched on it a second ago. Uh, you mentioned position. When you when you are teaching students, do you find that there are certain things that many of them need to work on? Yes, I would say the biggest thing is that people rely. They don't have an independent hand and seat. Um, they they want to use a little bit ride with the leg and ride with the hand. Um, and I make my riders, all of my riders, um, every third or fourth step, no matter what gate they're in, give the reins and know that the horse is in self-carriage and know that they can balance the horse on their seat. Um, I also make all my horses from babies to Grand Prix be able to do everything one-handed um, because I always think if I can do it wow. one-handed when I'm in the ring, I can do it two-handed. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a some, uh, tidbit that Christoph Hess, who I love riding with, gave mm -hmm. me. And I, the first time he asked me to do that, I was like, no, please don't make me do it because <laughs> I know it's going to be ugly. And he's like, do it anyway. And, and I thought that is absolutely amazing, right? If I can do it one handed, anybody can get on a two handed. I and mean, if I'm in the show, I know I can do it two handed. So I make all of my riders do that. And I make all my horses do that. That kind of falls into the category of my next question for you. Do you have a favorite exercise that you like to work on yourself and with your students? I love counter canner. I'm a mm -hmm. huge counter canner person. Um, people have always said, you're the flying change guru. I've had horses that come to me and they say, I oh, just, we give up. We can't get the changes. We can't get the ones or whatever. But I find counter canner so amazing. Like, so my new Grand Prix horse, um, who's been, very successful in his career. It, he really ha has a hard time doing it. And I asked myself, I'm like, but yet you can pee off of the stars for a nine, but you have a hard time counter cantering. And I feel like a lot of people don't use that once the horses know the changes, but I think it's, it's riding both sides of the horse and it's riding them really honestly straight. Um, and and just holding the weight on both hind legs, not just the inside, not just the outside. It's really mm -hmm. asking the horse to be honest and between two legs and two reins. And when a horse, when I find that hard for them, then that's what they need to do. Mm -hmm. um, that's probably my favorite exercise. <laughs> what are some exercises that you like to do with the counter canner? And especially speaking to uh, getting those flying changes a little less sticky than they might be. So I a lot of horses that come to me, I'll do the counter canner. And my favorite thing to do is, so let's say I'm on the left lead going to the right. And I'll say, can I flex you to the opposite side? Can I flex you to the inside? So you're supple for the new age of the flying change. And I've had so many students say, well, if I do that, they'll just, they'll just do the change. I'm like, because they're not truly on your aids and they're not truly supple. Because if you take the opposite flexion and there's tension, of course, they're just going to throw in the change because that's easier. So if I'm on the left lead and I'm going down the long side, going to the right, and I say, can I flex you to the inside and hold you with my new, my inside leg, which is my right, and then you wait for the change aid. So that's how I have improved changes, I don't know, my entire career is through counter cannon. And I'm curious actually for myself too. So I currently have a four-year-old warm blood um, and he was just started about six months ago, um, and he's great. And I think one of the next things that we're going to get to in our training is is teaching that flying change. So if you're working with someone on a young horse that's never been introduced to changes before, how would you teach them how to do it? Well, I think with uh, especially a four-year-old, I mean, for me, I don't start a flying change until I know I have canter walk, walk canter. Mm -hmm. Right. Because one, it balances the horse and it gets the horse in balance for the proper change, but it also puts the horses on the aid. So if I go canter walk and I'm going to the left and I think about my canter aid, which is my outside leg, I put my inside leg at the girth and I use my outside leg. That's the same aid as you're going to give it for the flying change. Mm -hmm. So once the horse understands that when you're in canter, then you switch your leg, they're like, oh, so the other lead. But I would, if I were you, I would do a lot of canter, walk, walk, canter. Okay. And ask yourself when you get to the walk and you give the aid, is there, is there a moment of pause? Is there a moment of confusion? Or is he quick off, off the strike of the aid? And normally horses that can do that well, the flying changes are quite easy. 
Okay, very, I appreciate that. Very interesting. And that is something that I actually have been working on him with a lot. Um, he's a little lazy by nature. So those, <laughs> those walk canner transitions are, we're working exactly. on them right now. <laughs> because you, you think if they're lazy now, just doing it from the walk, it's going to mm -hmm. be a little bit harder for them in the canter. And it's yeah. all about, it's not really, people think the flying change is so hard. It's just an aid, right? And so if they understand the aid, it won't be difficult. I, I really appreciate that. I'll definitely put that into practice when we so get, get started. So get on in those. quick now in those those. Trainings. Yeah. <laughs> yep. That's no what, time that's what we're lazy. working on. <laughs> that's what we're working on every day. <laughs> um, and going back to your um, eventing experience a little bit, my next question is about how you think basic dressage can help other disciplines like you know, the jumping and the cross country and eventing or even like hunter jumpers? Well, I think dressage all comes stems from balance, right? And I think a good jumper has to have very good balance approaching that fence. And I know from doing all those years of jumping, and I think it's also good for their bodies to learn to go over their back and be round. I think it keeps them sounder longer. Um, and I think it dressage is good for balance. It's good for suppleness. It's good for a, creating a good contact um, and teaching the horses to stay in that correct contact and balance, whether they're jumping or doing stadium jumping or doing cross country. Um, you're galloping down at you know 20 miles an hour to a, a, a water jump. You better pray that horse is in good balance, right? So I think that that all I think dressage benefits all disciplines. It's it, it's makes it comfortable for the horse and rider to be in carriage and any di discipline you're in. Do you ever do any cross training with any of your students? So we or live yourself? in Florida, so we don't have a lot of hills. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. When I was in Kentucky, we, we used the hills all the time. Um, I loved doing that, um, trotting up and down hills and you, in and out of water. So we don't really have anything here in Florida. Um, but what we do do is we hack them around the farm. Um, I don't do a lot of cavaletti work. I've not needed to over the years. Um, I know a lot of people believe in that. I've just not ever had a horse that needed it. Um, but so a normal week for us is we ride Monday, Tuesday, then Wednesday is a light day where we hack or trot around the, the tr trotting trails um, and then work Thursday, Friday. So and possibly a Saturday. So they go four to five days a week, but I don't, mm -hmm. mine are usually tired by that third day. Right. Um, and so I give them that day to kind of recover and, and I, I just don't want to drill them every single day. Yeah, absolutely. I, I find that going back to my four-year-olds, um, you know, I try not to drill them in the ring every day, especially with a young brain, you don't want to fry their brains. I try to always get out on the trails or do something different so exactly. that he doesn't get just, too mentally they, exhausted ring sour or that you know you want them to, mm -hmm. to want to work for you we've got two four-year-olds in the in the barn now and they're going four days a week and that's all they need they're still growing yeah it's it's actually very refreshing to hear that from you because that's a kind of a fight that I have with myself a lot um I you know how many days does he need and you know some people have such regimented programs that their horses are going six days a week but in in my case in my horse you know he really only needs about four days where I'm fighting with myself <laughs> where I'm like is it and okay to just so do four days <laughs> and it's so important to listen to him I mean whether it's a four-year-old or it's my two Grand Prix horses if they mm -hmm. come out and they feel supple and I you know, warm them up and I ride a canopy wet each way and I take a walk break and I do one line of ones, and maybe a little trot half that, I get off. Like I just, right. don't, yeah. you know, some people are like, I need to be in the ring for 45 minutes. I need to canter 20 meter circles and blah, blah. You know, you just kind of do what they feel comfortable and they tell you. Mm -hmm. So more, more all it, of the stories, listen, listen to your horse and know what your horse needs. Absolutely. Because they tell mm -hmm. us every day. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and just a few more questions for you, just to wrap up here. Um, and I love to ask this to riders I speak with, and I always get different answers. Um, and some are don't know always how to answer this, but um, oh no, why do you? <laughs> it's not that scary, but um, why do you think that you've been so successful as a rider? Oh gosh, um, I think compassion is the first word that comes to me. Um, I think 
I look back on the horses that I've had to train from my honorary Appaloosa um, to rehabbing one to fourth level to pulling a saddle right out of the field. Um, all those horses taught me compassion and how to problem solve in certain ways that now I, I just feel like, gosh, that is a hard question. Um, I think it's those <laughs> horses. I think it's riding not the average horse that I, I love being creative. Um, and that's my artistic side of myself. But I, I love the compassion of taking that horse. It's like, ugh, people are like, you're never going to do it. And the horse is like, I don't know if I can do it either. And I'm like, yes, you can. Because dressage is for every horse. And then taking that creativity. Um, I think that's my creativity, truly, mm -hmm. is what has made me um, be able to train all these horses to Grand Prix. Sure, it's training. And sure, it's, you know, dressage. But it's also being creative. And what do you think is the hardest part of the sport for you? Um, gosh, I think, um, no, the ups and downs of it. You know, I, sh I could say something like, oh, the discipline. No, I'm very disciplined. I could say, oh, you know, the physical fitness. No, I run every day. <laughs> you know, so I'm doing all those things and those things don't frustrate me. But I would say, um, the ups and downs of the sport, the highs and lows, you know, when you're on, you're yeah. rocking and rolling on this horse and all of a sudden you have an injury or a setback mm -hmm. or all of a sudden I've broken my collarbone. I think, you know, we put so much time, effort and money into the sport. And when there is a setback, it's devastating. I mean, that, that for me is the hardest part of the sport. Yeah. I think a lot of people would agree with that. <laughs> yeah, I, cer I certainly do. <laughs> um, and then what do you think, if you could speak to your younger self, what advice would you give her? Gosh, see, that's even harder. Um, <laughs> let's see. I would say it's okay to not be good and it's okay to fail. I think all of us as, as professionals and amateurs and anybody that's in this crazy sport, we're afraid to fail. Um, but I think through failing or... Yeah, I think through failure, it makes us better. And I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. It was like mm -hmm. I had to be the best I could be and, you know, kind of beat yourself up over it. And and then but then the sport becomes not fun. And I think it's okay to fail yeah. to get better and to know mm -hmm. that you're going to have failure. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, yeah, I was way too hard on myself. So. I think, uh, like you, you mentioned it a couple of times, we are, as equestrians, such perfectionists. That it's hard to come to terms with that <laughs> sometimes. It is. And, you know, it's funny. One of my longtime friends posted on Facebook the other day, and it just rang through to me. I mean, through and through. And she said, I don't like to post videos on my riding because all I see is imperfection. And I thought, you nailed yeah. it. Mm -hmm. You know, like, and I said, that's exactly what we do. Um, and I think that being on dressage on demand I always want to call it dressage training online. I was so nervous to go on that because I thought, I don't want people to see my imperfection. Like, I don't want to, mm. I don't want to showcase that, Risa. Like, are you crazy? And then I, and then I got so much feedback, like, oh, this is how you problem solve, and this is, and it was okay to not be perfect. Yeah. Because there is no perfect, right? Mm -hmm. There's just no perfect. So that helped me. But I would say. We're all our worst enemies. I mean, yeah. And it's it's sad to hear her say that, but we all feel that, right? That's yeah. When we when we look at ourselves, we're still training ourselves. We're like, oh, that's wrong, and this is wrong, and this is wrong. <laughs> mm -hmm. But um, yeah, that's what I would say. It's okay to to not be perfect. It's okay to fail. And uh, what's next for you? What's on your schedule? So my new horse, I've had. Um, gosh, it's it'll be a year in a couple months. Um, we showed in WEC our first show, in which we won at the Grand Prix, uh, and then he had an injury in the stall, um, mm -hmm. so that was kind of deflating. So we've been home training, and we will do our first CDI in September up at WEC, and really excited about that. And then I have my um, other mare, who's a little bit younger than he is, and she will do her, um, she's going to do I2 in Grand Prix as well in the open division. Excellent. Well, good so, luck. Very excited. Thank you. Yeah, Thank that's you. very exciting. 
Well, that's all that I have for you today. Is there anything that you would like to add before we wrap up here? Thinking about going back to simplicity. Um, mm -hmm. And I was thinking about this, this lesson that I gave the other day. And um, the, the woman was like, are, are you kidding? Like, all we're going to do is walk. And I thought, yes, because the walk is not correct. So I was going to say to all riders at any level, like, you know, we get up in the day, in the morning, and we plan our outfits. <laughs> Some of us plan our outfits according to our horses as well. And you put into your mind's eye of like what that perfect ride is going to be. And when it's not perfect, we all know we obsess about it all day long. We're like, oh, my mm -hmm. gosh, we had a bad ride. It's the end of the day, right? <laughs> it's, it's, it's the end of the world. So thinking about like how to keep it simple to speak your horse's language. Every every horse has a different personality, right? And they all have a different shape and they all have a different mind. And so what I'm trying to say is learn to speak your horse's language because their language is very simple. And if you get on and you say, you know, you ask questions, you don't dictate, you don't force, but you ask questions and you ask the horse, okay, do you feel sluggish today? Do you feel in front of my leg? Do you feel like you want to work? And then if they do, then you say, do you feel like you can do collection? Do you feel like you can do sideways? And I always see what people do, even when I'm in a clinics, they'll say, well, but I have to walk, trot, and canter. And I'm like, no, you don't. If you haven't mastered first gear, why go into second mm -hmm. gear? Why go into third gear? So as hard mm -hmm. as this sport is, that's what I mean by keeping it simple. Um, go back to the basics. So you don't obsess about having that bad ride at the end of the day. So that's just kind of what I wanted to get across. I mean, in, in, in all of our minds, we think driving to the barn, I'm like, I'm going to ride like Charlotte Desjardins today, you know, <laughs> like, or somebody might say, yeah. I want to be Carl Hester. And so we all have that vision of what it should look like and what we want it to look like, because at the end of the day, dressage is motion, art in motion. And so we, we create that in our mind. And so what I'm saying is try to create that every time you ride. And if it starts getting gray and you start mudding the waters and the horse doesn't understand your, what you're saying, don't hammer on it and try to make it better through that process. Go back to what's simple for you and your horse, whether it's training level or fourth level, whether it's a walk pirouette or leg yield, and then say, okay, let's, now we're on the same page. Can we move forward? So it's always, it's not, Always, I have to walk, track, can, or go both directions. Some days you might not. And I, and I think riders need to know that that's okay. There is no uh, race to the finish line. But right. your horse needs to understand that every day you're going to do best by him. And you're going to be very clear and kind and patient. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what I wanted to say. Because I think everybody gets on sometimes and they're like, I have to do this, 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 and this. No, you don't. You have to do what's right for that day. And not right. be in a rush. And our horses have off days sometimes too. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, I think that we have to remember that like the horse doesn't wake up in the morning and think, oh, I'm going to get her on that half past left. Like there's no way I'm going to have rib cage bend, right? Like they don't do that. It's our job to make it simple and clear. And sometimes if I'm riding a horse and I'm cantering half past left, I'm like, you, you don't feel connected enough. So I'll do it in the walk. And then I go back to right. the canter. Back to the canter. You know, I just, right. I feel like through my years of teaching clinics, I see a lot of people are like, well, I'll just keep hammering on it and, and it's going to get better and keep doing it. And by the time you've done that, you've done 18,000 laps and half past left, right? Mm -hmm. It's not, it's not, the communication's not happening. So right. just go back to first gear and, and make it simple. This has been wonderful. And I really appreciate those training tidbits. I know not only for, for myself, I know everyone will love to hear them, but I can't wait to take what you've told me and and apply it to my riding I'm going out to the barn right after well, just, we get off just here <laughs> you're gelding that when your legs get quick his legs better get quick <laughs> yeah. yeah that's what we're working on <laughs> um but yeah thank you so much I really appreciate you hopping on and it's been wonderful chatting with you and getting to know you oh thank you so much for having me Thanks for listening to this week's episode with Krissa Hoffman and a big thank you to the sponsor of this week's episode Troxel Learn more at troxelhelmets.com. You can subscribe to the Practical Horseman podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. While you're there, please rate and review the show. Also, tune into our mini-sode series, The Fod Pod, which is released every other Sunday. 
you'll hear audio lessons from our favorite Practical Horseman On Demand clips. At Practical Horseman On Demand, you can enjoy hundreds of how-to videos and get insider access to exclusive interviews and lectures, slow motion demonstrations, and step-by-step -step tutorials taught by top-level pros in the hunter, jumper, equitation, and eventing disciplines. When you tune into the FOD pod, listen closely for a promo code for 15% off your Practical Horseman On Demand subscription. Thanks again for listening to this week's episode. I'm Julia Murphy, and you've been listening to the Practical Horseman Podcast. <laughs>